And so in the um, in the lesson for today, I put um, the power, wait, did I put that in, the, why am I in 47? Did I post that in the wrong thing? No, hold on. But I think I put the wrong PowerPoint in there. No, no, I didn't. That's right. I think I just called it 47 and 40 instead of 46. Oh my goodness, things that happen when you're up late at night um, or early in the morning, whichever one. Um, no, because that's evidence-based practice, so we're okay. I just put, oh, it's chapter 47. I'm thinking it's class 47. Um, and then we'll do the, um, we'll do the uh, case study there. And so let me do this. What do you guys, when I say evidence-based practice, what, um, what comes to mind? What do you think of, or what have your experiences been with research or evidence-based practice? Reliable information. There you go. Facts. Mm -hmm. Policy based on research trials. Ooh, nice. Peer reviewed. Yeah, it's hard to go, um, when you go in to find an article, to um, actually find maybe one that's peer reviewed or that you can actually find the full text of it. Sometimes it's just a little abstract um, of information and not, um, and, that, and that's all you can get. And then I, I spend forever trying to, um, <laughs> trying to find the full text of the, uh, of the article. So what else? Um, did, so like, when was the last time you did research? Nobody? Anybody do research? I did some grant research a couple of years ago for a needle exchange. Ooh, interesting. Tell us about that. Uh, it was a really cool grant. It was a year long grant used to just kind of implement um, public health and community safety. Nice. And at the time I had lived in Santa Cruz and it was when, um, I can't remember the name of the organization, but there was a big family focused organization that really wanted to get rid of all needle exchanges, all harm reduction type of work. Mm -hmm. And so they were losing a lot of funding. So I was actually able to get a grant that helped them still keep some of their services going. And wow. I got to just help with that a little bit, just a very tiny bit. And what was the research uh, process like? It was extensive and the grant writing was really tedious, but. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. as most grant writing is, yes. <laughs> because they do, they want all of the work cited. They want the articles, they want um, source material. We had interviews with certain people. So yeah, it, it was extensive, but it felt very, very rewarding when it was all done. Oh, good. That's good. Um, so what do you have on your, what can you see on your screen right now? Uh, PowerPoint, it looks like. Oh, okay. Does it say evidence and then has my long name and alphabet soup after it? <laughs> yes, as a matter of fact, yes, it does. Um, okay. So let me, there we go. So the objectives, these are the objectives for, um, for today. And they're kind of, um, let's see, talk about some journal articles and then um, application of the evidence. Have you ever seen, um, if you've been in healthcare or someplace else at your work, like Amanda was saying, where there was like a problem at work or something that was identified that needed to be changed. Uh, and then there, the policy was changed, maybe there was some research or evidence came came up and they actually changed a policy at work. I would say the, the policy in regards to the flu vaccine with egg allergies. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oops, sorry, I'm trying to get myself 
Okay. Um, we actually had, um, you can do oral care on um, preemies, because um, my background's uh, pediatrics and NICU, and uh, we used to not feed the babies. But in order to, evidence came out that in order to what we call prime the gut, if you take the mom's colostrum and put it on like a little swab and swab the baby's mouth with it, it primes the gut and they have not less um, uh, neck, necrotizing enterocolitis because you've primed the gut, but you're not, you know, dumping food down. Um, and that was evidence-based. And then we actually ha uh, put together, actually had a, a person that worked with me, where does she work now? She works at Natividad now in the NICU. And, um, but she was at Chomp with me and she actually wrote the policy and we kind of did it together. It was really cool. So now like everybody does what, she, you know, the policy she put together, we do oral care uh, all the time. So it's kind of cool when, you, when it comes to, um, like it actually happens, right? What you did actually comes to fruition, like Amanda's saying, um, it's, it's really a, a good feeling. Um, so what is, when we're gathering evidence, there's different um, definitions, so um, a testimony of facts, somebody said facts, right? Tending to prove or disprove a conclusion. So um, a lot of times I think about evidence, evidence-based nursing, it's like the scientific, like scientific theory. Like when you were in um, chemistry or biology or whatever, you have a hypothesis, right? And then you test it out and um, that kind of, you know, that kind of thing. And some things work and some things don't. Um, uh, a lot of big words in this one, conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of theory derived research based information in making decisions about care delivery uh, to individuals or groups of patients and in consideration individual needs and preferences. Um, so that's based that's that's a lot of big words, but basically looking at theories um, and research to um, make decisions about how you care for patients. Right. So I think that's that's uh, really important uh, infection control things like that has been um, you know, pretty important uh, things that have happened. Um, an ongoing process by which evidence, nursing theory, and the practitioner's clinical expertise are critically evaluated and considered in conjunction with patient involvement to provide delivery of optimum nursing care for the individual. So I like that one because it takes the, um, the practitioner, the practitioner's clinical expertise into, um, into account because a lot of times you'll hear nurses say, well, I just have this feeling or I've done this before and this is what's really worked for me. Um, you know, we have different, uh, I'm trying to think, you know, maybe different um, creams for a diaper rash or something. And so we really like this. And so it works for these, these uh, particular patients, something like that. So I, I, like, I like that particular one, but yes, we're trying to, to find facts and then to either prove or disprove the, um, a conclusion and move forward and hopefully um, provide um, evidence and, and be policy makers, right? Um, so what I would like to do is um, do a quick little, um, like a think pair share, just put you in, in really small um, breakout rooms. And I want you guys to talk about um, the difference between data and evidence, right? So what's the difference between data and evidence, kind of, we, you almost kind of think a 110 for that. Um, so uh, can you have data without evidence? Can you have evidence without data? Um, so I'd like you guys to, uh, to, do, to um, do that for a couple minutes. I figure maybe that'll get you kind of warmed up. Um, and so you're looking at the difference between data and evidence. Okay, and so uh, like about five minutes. I'm not going to pop in because you don't have that much time. Um, and I'm going to create the rooms. So let me do, oops, I'm going to do that. There we go. Okay, all right, have fun. There you go. So can you guys get into it? Did you get the invitation? There you go. All right.
Welcome back. Hello. People. Hello. Hello. People are back. Okay. Yes, Yay. we are back. Yay. So, um, how many of you actually went to look up the information? That's great. Yeah, make sure you guys mute unless you're going to, yeah. So, how many people actually, like, uh, you can hit your uh, reactions, you know, like for a thumbs up if you want. Um, if you actually went to like Google it, for example, right? Isn't that pretty much what other um, what other search engines are there? Do we use other search search engines anymore besides Google? <laughs> I don't know, right? Um, Yahoo, right? Yahoo has a search engine. Um, DuckDuckGo. What the heck is DuckDuckGo? Yeah, it doesn't track you. So if you're a, a privacy person, oh, you're anti-Google. <laughs> oh, oh, ask Jeeves, right? I forgot. I forgot about that. Yeah, Bing. Yeah, there you go. My, my computer tries to force me to use Bing, and I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I no, put no. on like add-ons and stuff that I'm like, no, like deflect off of my Microsoft Edge, like all this stuff. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I don't like being controlled. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> and so what did you come up with? What's the difference between um, data or data, data, and evidence? Um, so I was with uh, Whitney and we kind of discussed like kind of the versus part of it was like you, you end up getting your evidence from the data and so but not all of the data will will lead to or become evidence and so you can have data without evidence but you can't really have evidence without data right does that make sense mm -hmm. that's kind of what we sense. came up with right so gotcha and uh, Vanessa shared da uh, data is information that one has collected and evidence would be the interpretation of the data so that's exactly what what Kelly's saying um, and so it's it's important to to understand the the distinction between that um, I I personally kind of feel like depending on the situation you could fit um, data to meet whatever evidence you wanted it to be like I didn't used to feel that way but now um, especially because of technology and how far-reaching like I come from the days when we had um, uh, you know, encyclopedias, these books that would sit on a shelf from A through Z. And that's how I did my research when I was doing research papers in high school. Like I would pull out <laughs> and flip through the, right? And then I had to cite my encyclopedia. But now we just push a button to get that information. I remember when they actually put, was it Encyclopedia Britannica was like, you didn't even have apps back then, but like you could access Encyclopedia Britannica on your computer. So that would have been what the early nineties or something like that. And, um, and that was just absolutely amazing. Um, and then my, um, yeah, CDs. Yeah, you could get it on the CDs. Um, yeah, Cor Kelly's like, correlation does not equal causation, correct. Um, yeah, you had it on, on CDs, right? And then I remember uh, in 19, was 91, um, my son was born with um, something called gastroschisis, which is where his intestines were outside his body. He was um, 32 weeks, 32 week preemie. And I remember getting online and I'd never really done it. I just basically used it for writing, typing papers and things. And um, cause there was no, it was AOL, it was dial up. It was like, it took forever. Um, and I found a blog of other moms and some dads who had kids with the same thing. And it was like, my mind was blown. And that, that would, those were like the initial blogs, uh, discussions that took like forever to get information back and forth. Um, but we use a lot of evidence-based practice and thinking, well, what has science done? How, how do we, you know, what do we do with our kids? How soon does this happen or that happen? Or the same thing with my second son who had a cleft palate. Like, 
the um, hospital in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where we were, the first one, they wanted to wait till he was two years old to close the palate. They're like, we're doing this study and we think that blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you guys are crazy. I'm not doing this study. And we went to another, um, another uh, hospital. Um, so, because you, you have the right to say if you do or don't want to be in the study. So when we look at the scope of evidence, right, it, um, the book looks at it in terms of like this discovery, uh, they call it discovery bench research. So it's, um, you look at, at how you, what you're all discovering, right? Like you get all this, are you gathering everything and you kind of sit it on this bench, right? You get this little lineup of things, right? And then you take that research and it becomes translate, translational as you look at it and determine how it can affect patient care for the better, hopefully. Um, and so the, um, the initial bench research, right, is based on patient care. Usually you've identified a problem and you're trying to, that's usually how it works. Um, and then it also kind of works the other way because if you are going to provide better, safer, quicker, whatever patient care, then there's gotta be somebody out there doing the research. So me personally, as a, as a nurse, I'm not the person, I don't wanna be the nurse doing the, the research. I'll certainly, you know, do your hypothesis and do whatever study you want, but I, I don't wanna be the person looking it up. That is, you don't want me doing that. That, that just bores me to no end. Um, when you're looking at attributes of evidence, like what makes good evidence? Is it good? Is it bad? I mean, and what is good and bad? How does that relate? So there's certain attributes. Um, Box 47.1 in Giddens has this. Um, and so um, replicability, being able to replicate it. So findings are verified when repeated in other studies. So if other people do the same study, then they get the same result, results. Um, and then reliability, the findings are consistent. So, <clears throat> excuse me, again, when you repeat the study, then the reliability, the findings are the same. And then validity is the accuracy of the application and the findings. So is it valid? Is it, is it accurate? Is it, you know, we found out that we can repeat it, it's reliable, and it, it is accurate. It is accurate. Um, and then minor attributes that you have, um, you know, would it be publicly available? Is it understandable and use, usable? In other words, if I wanted to replicate the study or if I wanted to actually use the evidence, um, can I find it? Is it understandable? Can I actually use it? Because it doesn't do me any good. That's where I get frustrated is I'll go look up something and I can't get the full text of it. Um, does, that make, does that make sense? So those are the attributes of evidence. Um, and then levels of evidence. So the quality um, of evidence varies. And so how do you know that something is, is good evidence, right? How do you, how do you grade that? Um, we looked uh, on Monday, there was a, a link that took you um, to, the, to the website. I'm gonna show you in a second. And we were talking about hypertension. Um, and so the, they actually grade the research in terms of they strongly recommend it, they recommend it, there's no recommendation, they recommend against it, or there's not enough evidence, insufficient evidence to recommend for or against something. That's box 47.2 in, um, in Giddens. So I'm making you do stuff because it's Friday. Get, get you guys awake and alert. <laughs> Check your LOC. Are you awake, alert, times four? <laughs> so um, I'm gonna put you back in learning groups. Um, probably of four, and the, um, the website is the US, uh, US uh, Preventive Services Task Force.org, so make sure you write that down. Um, it's, it was actually a link from Monday's lesson. It's a task force, and so when you go there, you're going to actually have to do a little figuring of, about where to find this, but they have recommend, recommendations for um, Hypertension or coronary artery disease, CAD, CAD, right? So, so you're going to um, go in. The reason you're doing it is because you're going to go in and compare and contrast recommendations and categories. Because when you go into the cardiovascular disease section, cardiovascular disease risk, you'll get all these different categories and you start to see an A and a B or an I or a D. And so what I want you to do is to um, go in and find the high blood pressure in adults, that screening, that's the one I had you look at on Monday, for those of you that, that went there, 
um, and then to compare it or to look and see if you can find the um, screening with electrocardiography. Right, so do you understand what you're doing? You're gonna go to this website, the US Preventive Services Task Force.org, and you're gonna, there's a section, uh, tab that says recommendations. You're gonna go there, find cardiovascular disease, and it will take you to this page of the, the different screenings that they have um, looked at the research, and this is what they feel. Oh, thank you, Roberto, um, uh, what they're looking at, okay? And then, talk about it. What is it? What do you, you know, what do you see when you go to that, um, to the site? What does it make you think, uh, you know, comparing those two different, um, the two different um, cat categories there? Were there any other categories that um, interested you or that you thought the evidence was or the grading was, um, uh, the, the grades that they received were, um, whoops, hold on were um, different than what you thought, like the research was different or you, you, you know, something that surprised you. Um, so let me see here. Okay, so we're gonna recreate all rooms and let's do that. Alrighty, so you good? I think you're in groups of about three. There you go. You got this, have fun. I'll probably pop into a couple rooms. And there goes Amanda almost, there she goes, yay.
Hey, John. All right, let's pull people back. All right, you guys are coming back. Woo! We're coming back. Yay! They're like, get me out of here. <laughs> Bring me back to the main room. That's a pretty cool Death Star. Which do you, are you on a specific planet? Um, yeah, but I couldn't tell you which one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. I can't either. This is, so this is more of the, um, the Rogue One series, more of the 1975 uh -huh. planet. 
Like I'll go ahead. I want to go hang out with the Ewoks. I'll be fine. Put me on indoor and I'm, I'm, I'm good. Um, <laughs> I'm not as, as up on that. All right. Welcome back. Um, Hugo, could you do me a favor? Cause I have way too many things up that I can't even keep track of. Could you pull up, could you share your screen of the, the website that I showed that had the grid with the grades on it? Yeah. Would you please? Thank you. This one, right? Yeah, that one. Thank you. Um, so this was actually where I wanted to go and I, I did post a link in the main chat, but then I remembered you can't really see it unless you come out of the break room. So I tried to get to a couple of you to show you um, this. And so Roberto, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily wrong it, that the links just took you to the specific study, which is fine. What I wanted you guys to look at, can you scroll up please Hugo to the top and then kind of scroll down was that these, this particular column has the grade, right? And so you could see the grading. And what I wanted you to notice was that, um, at, yeah, there's a D. Yeah. So that was the one that we were looking at. So it was a D and an I, right? So it does that with the electric heart. Like, I don't want to do that. There's insufficient <laughs> evidence, but look at the high blood pressure uh, screening. The next one down. Yeah. That has an A that's an A grade. So that's recommended. So I, that's, that's what I was hoping that you would get out of it. And then when you actually go in and read it, if people clicked on links, thank you, Hugo. Um, if people actually clicked on the, the links, like what, what information did you get? What did you see? What, what did you think of having to navigate? It was confusing. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's part of research as well, right? Trying to figure things out. No, I just I liked how um, not only did it provide the grade, but it kind of provided the rationale. If you kind of clicked into some of the some of the things, it would show you why they provided that grade. Um, and it wasn't just like, well, because the research sucked. You know, it was like it actually said, you know, like the um, you know, like the, like the one that I looked at was COPD and why they suggested against screening for COPD in asymptomatic people. And they actually said that um, because COPD is not a a, um, a, you can't really cure it. Like, why would you want to like screen for it and have to pay the cost associated with screening when you find out and you can't even do anything about it. So that's why they suggested against it, you know? And so, and cause I was kind of thinking, why, why would it, you know, why would somebody say don't screen for COPD? But then I realized like, you know, there, you know, there's nothing really you can do about it after. So why would you need to find out about it sort of thing? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I guess you could find out that you had it, but you probably already knew you had it. Um, I mean, there's risk factors for sure. And, and they were saying the cost associated with it didn't really justify finding out that you had it just so you can walk around with a badge that says I have COPD. I mean, you know, there's not really much else, you know? <laughs> yeah, all your inhalers and your medications and, you know, yeah. What else did anybody else have? Did, what other thoughts did you have? Reading made me understand why the grade was what it is. Yeah. So you can't really like base your judgment just on the title and then the grade. Like, so what we were talking about when you popped into our room, the one I was looking at was cardiovascular disease risk screening with um, electrocardiography and it had a D grade. And I was like, what the heck? Like, how, you know, and so I opened it up and actually looked at the rationale and it was, it was more specifically about whether whether you should be resting or after exercise taking the e, the EKG. And so there was more specific than, just, you know, cause the title of it was like, what do you mean? Like, you know, what do you mean? E, right. you know, recommend EKGs or whatever. And so I was like, I need to look more at that. Cause obviously something's not lining up here. So they're looking, yeah, they're looking at the specific, like a study or research or, or thing that they want you to, to do for the screening. Cause again, we're talking about health promotion, disease prevention. Um, but they're looking at the methods or how you're doing it or what the cost benefit uh, risk evaluation. Yeah, on, on that particular study, I actually clicked through to look at the study and, yeah. the, results, and the results basically said there's no evidence for this, which is kind of why it, it's a degrade. So you kind of go through how they analyze their data, how they set their study up. So that was kind of cool, like one more step down and you mm -hmm. see exactly why they didn't recommend it. Yep, keep, keep clicking. Keep going. Good. Okay. So it sounds like uh, 
sounds like my objective was met because my objective for you was to get you in there, right? And to be clicking around and looking around and, and looking at the grades and, and keep asking why. That's why you kept clicking. Well, why is it this way? Well, why is it a D? Okay, well, why does it say this? What, you know, so that's, that's great. Uh, what do you see on your screen now? Recognizing quality evidence. Good. That's what you're supposed to see. Wrong way. No. Oh my gosh. We did that. There we go. We just did that. You're like, no, get away from that one. There we go. Okay. So this is called the evidence pyramid. And basically, I guess every researcher does a pyramid for something. I don't know. Um, but if you look at the bottom, it's sort of um, more generalized type of information. And as you make your way up the pyramid, it's more um, more specific. So ex for example, a randomized controlled double blind study, which uh, we have a definition for on a later slide, but basically it's random people. You don't, the, the researchers and the participants don't know what they're getting, the placebo, the medication, whatever it is. And so that's really, um, I guess it carries more weight in terms of being reliable um, and somewhat, re somewhat re repeatable. Um, but if you look down at ideas, editorials, opinions, that's, that's really not factually based. So that's kind of um, a slide that can show you um, how to think about the types of, um, of evidence. And then we're going to talk about how we relate this into the practice of nursing. So there's a couple different types of what we would call literature and types of research studies. Um, and certainly if anybody has more experience with this than I do, uh, uh, speak up. Like I said, I'm not the person that does, the, I'm not the research person. Um, primary literature, when you're, when you're doing a literature search and you're trying to find evidence for whatever point you're trying to make, primary literature is the original research. It's the original research study that was conducted. And then the types of research that you will see there would be um, quantitative, qualitative, or a mixed design, which would be a um, combination of both quantitative and qualitative. Can anybody explain the difference between quantitative and qualitative research? Okay, so, oh, maybe here we have somebody in the chat, sorry. Takes a while to type. Just lost what it said. Isn't quantitative research related to numbers and qualitative related to description? That's a good way to put it. I kind of like that. Was that JJ? Who said that? That was good. That was good. Um, yeah, that was me, JJ. Okay, I, can't, I can only see like four people, so I'm trying to go off of, of um, what you sound like. Um, Exactly. So quantitative is like really numbers. You're going in and asking specific questions and there's specific measurements. Qualitative is more of sort of, which I actually like those, me personally, I like those ones better, but it's more of the feeling. So it's like, tell me how you feel about this. And you can survey a bunch of people and, and find trends in that, um, in that evidence. Yep. And then you can also have studies that mix that together, mix the two types together. Um, and then secondary literature, <clears throat> a lot of places, or a lot, a lot of times when you search something, you'll find a study, and it's not really a study, it's more of a summary, because what they've done is they've gone back and looked at all the quantitative and qualitative research for a particular topic and sort of provided a summary for you in that article. So it's not the actual research, but it's, it's a summary, um, which then can also, um, you can also get practice guidelines. So say that you were looking up something and then it'll, it'll prop up, pop up practice guidelines, things that you should be, be doing, kind of like the screenings that you just looked at. Um, then there's also systematic reviews and analyses, which is similar to the summaries. It's not just, because um, you can go and, do, and just say, well, this person did this one and this person, you know, like just give a summary, but the systematic review actually goes and compares and contrasts all those things which is kind of nice. It's kind of like they um, did the research for you, which is nice. And then um, the next question would be, what is bias and how can it affect research? I think we kind of already talked about that a little bit. Um, you know, in terms of, I don't know, do you guys want to give a definition of bias or can you think of an example? 
I think a good example would be like a pharmaceutical company when they're coming out with a new drug and the trials that they do to kind of try and prove that the drug is effective without many side effects. And so their bias is that they want people to buy it. Um, and it can affect their research because maybe they're only picking kind of like the best of the best candidates to take their drug. And they may not be picking people that have um, other health issues. Um, and so you, sometimes it can be hard to know, like, is this drug going to actually work for a whole population like they're claiming it will um, or will it not? Mm -hmm. That's a good example. Um, and we have a lot. I mean, I want to get into a political discussion, but we have a lot of different studies and information coming out right now. Like that's a whole nother lecture and, and discussion we could have um, based on, excuse me, but basically saying, you know, I, I'm kind of taking the evidence this way because this is really what I want it to say, right? And so you have to really uh, watch out for that. So as the researcher, um, you're the one that's involved, right? You're doing it, you're discovering the evidence and categorizing it and, and collating it and all that. And then, um, you know, as, as a nurse, some nurses really like to do that piece. You've got uh, quality improvement nurses and data. There's all kinds, um, if that's the thing that you like to do. So you can be an investigator, you can be a collaborator, um, you can do the data collection, you can do the data analysis. Um, I like to be the delivery of the intervention person. That's where I fit in there. Um, and uh, the model that's often used is what's called plan, do, study, act. So you plan and then you, you do, and then you look at the results and then based on that you act or put a new policy in place or, or whatever. So we, we, you should hear, have heard of Plan, Do, Study, Act because that speaks to a lot of, a lot of things. Um, consumer, as a consumer of evidence, right? So as, um, uh, you know, as nurses, we abide by policy and procedures. Patients receive care based on policies and procedures. And so um, I don't know, I don't think it matters where you work. There's a policy and procedure manual somewhere. When I worked in the NICU um, the first time, like 10 years ago, our policy and procedure manual, I kid you not, well, it doesn't really do it justice, but we had two that were like this thick because they were on paper. They hadn't been put on the computer yet. And now where do you go to find policies and procedures if you're at SVMH or Natividad? On the intranet portal. Mm -hmm. yeah, computer. Right, you can, yeah, on the computer, you go to the intranet and they, whichever system they have and you can pull it up. Um, for me, it gets frustrating sometimes because I can't find sometimes what I'm looking for. Um, but they do have, you'll see at the bottom, you know, to have all the dates of when it was revised, reviewed, amended, all that. And it has to be approved by a committee. And generally speaking on the, at the unit level, you sort of approve it and then it goes up to the department and then on up the, up, up the chain. Um, and then they should be regularly updated. It doesn't necessarily have to be every year, but it's according to the policy <laughs> of the, of, of the, um, business, um, you know, as to how often, but you should at least review them. So for us in nursing and allied health, our policy and procedure meeting is coming up. It's like October, no, what's Monday? Monday's the, yeah, it's October. So policy and procedure is the fifth. Our faculty meeting's the 28th. And so pa policy and procedure is the fifth. So if you guys wanna come, um, hopefully you, you get the email um, for that. And and that's what we do. We review nursing and allied health policies and procedures every year. We don't necessarily um, update them or do something with them, but every year we at least look at them. Um, and in light of technological advances or pandemics or you know whatever, then we, um, we can update them. And then when you're finding, trying to find answers to a, to a practice question or to a problem, right? You're doing your research. So you kind of Again, I kind of feel like it's the nursing process a little bit, but you take this systematic approach, right? You should have a question. What is this, this question that you're trying to find the answer to? You're gonna look in the literature, you're gonna look at the evidence that you found, you're gonna kind of apply it and then evaluate it. Who, who are consumers? Um, who are, as nurses, who are our consumers? Patient? Patients, right? Pa patients is, is one. That's what I was thinking of. Um, I, I tend to feel that, you know, our whole team is our consumer, but um, yes, patients. And what do patients do? They 
they look everything up before they come to the doctor or to you or um, into the birthing center with their you know 10 page birth plan nothing against a 10 page birth plan i i'm all for that it just means you're going to end up with a c-section that's just all i know uh but that would be interesting to do a study <laughs> on that um but i feel like the the patients are um your clients are more um, informed because they they go and they research things, but what are they using as their source? Are they going to peer reviewed journals? Probably not, right? And so Google, Wikipedia. Uh -huh. Yeah, please don't ever use Wikipedia <laughs> as a source. Please don't cite that as a source. Um, and so I'll show you when we get done with the PowerPoint, I'll show you where in Canvas you can access the, um, if you don't already know where you can access the health science literature. Um, and then you have to put in certain keywords and depending on the word you choose or the combination of words or how you phrase it, um, you'll get one set of articles that will come up. And then if you set, say it a different way, you get a whole nother set. Um, so you, you have to really kind of know the question that, you're, that you really truly are asking that you, that you wanna know. Um, how would someone who's an explorer do with the literature search? Anybody? I would say that it's really difficult because you, um, well, for myself, I, I'll, I'll see something that interests me and then all of a sudden I'm down a whole different <laughs> rabbit hole when I need, just need someone to pull me back. So it's challenging. Yes, exactly, exactly. And then, and then the, the execute person is probably like, where is it? You know, like just get to the first, right? You know, so it, it kind of, it can kind of play in there. Um, and so when you are looking at the quality of the evidence, right, you have to look at that. So you want to look at, for example, you know, is it a .edu, a .gov, a .org, like what, um, you know, what domain is it coming from? Um, who's the author? And like um, you were saying earlier, who's the sponsor, right? Is it, or Emily was saying, right, like is it a, a pharmaceutical company or something, right? Who's, who's sponsoring this, um, this study? And then um, how current is it? Like how far back, if you're citing articles, how far back is okay to go? Is it okay to go? How many years back? I feel like it would depend on the topic and how much research is being done on it. Like if it's something that's being constantly researched, if you do an article from 10 years ago, that stuff might be outdated. But if it's something that's not researched or it's not changed very much, then maybe 10 years ago is going to be the most um, current information. So we try to stick with like in the last five years, but sometimes you're right. Sometimes there's a topic that they're not doing much research on. And so you have to go back. Generally speaking, unless it's, it's primary literature, um, we, which would be the original study and we would go back and reference that. Um, we try to keep it within the five to 10, 10 years of, of currency. Um, and the same with textbooks. When we look at textbooks, I'm on the curriculum committee campus-wide and we look at the, the books that you're using as resources. And a lot of times the comments that we give out or get um, are that, do you have a more recent edition of the textbook, right? And so, um, and sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes it's no. We have uh, references for Swanson's caring theory, but those are, it's from her sentinel, from her initial, um, her initial study. And so that's what we just say. That we, that's, that's the study, man. That's where we're getting it from. And I'm sorry, it's like 25 years old, but that's, it's still relevant and, and current. Um, and so another, I, I like this little acronym, the CRAP test, right? Is it current, relevant? Who's the authority? Who's doing it? Is it accuracy and why? Why did they do? What was the purpose of the study? To, to sell a product to, you know, depending on what it is. And then these are what they call the exemplars. These are like the randomized controlled trial. I was explaining it's got the least amount of bias. Um, the TX for me is treatment, by the way, TX. Um, you know, the control groups are random. They don't know what treatment's being given. Longitudinal studies, I love longitudinal studies. I think they're really cool because you study a group of people over a specified period of time. 
um, and you can look at long-term health changes or you can see certain um, patterns. I have a couple of videos I could actually post um, for you that we were looking at, um, you know, over, uh, interviewing um, children over time, which is great because children have that quick growth period. So it, it was really kind of interesting. Um, and then looking at um, ethnography, so studies a group um, over a long period of time and the researcher would actually become a participant, um, an, an observer in the group, or something like um, uh, um, you'll have somebody come in and do like a time and effort study. So the researcher will actually be with you and in the work environment with you and um, to see how your what your timing and your use of time um, is I hate those ones when people are watching me work um, or to look at new grads in decision making because there's there's actually quite a lot of studies coming out um, and then practice guidelines right for 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 us on the current best practice um, there's also something called a ex, an expert opinion so I I guess I don't know what the most common example would be but I think of like a trial right you have your witness that's coming in you have your expert opinion that's going to give their um, because of their experience, you know, and their um, what they've seen, but you can provide the evidence, but it's still kind of opinion. I don't know. It it just sort of depends how how you know who's an expert. Am I an expert? Is is Ms. Clark an expert? Is you know Whitney an expert? We're probably all experts in something. Um, so I just think you have to kind of take take a look at that uh, as well. All right, so what you need to know, you need to be able to describe the attributes of evidence because there's five questions on the exam. Um, attributes of evidence, um, understanding the grading system, which is the activity you just finished, understand the difference between primary and secondary literature, recognize if something has bias. Um, the P PDSA and PICO, those are actually in your reading um, and they're different ways of looking at how to conduct a study um, how to conduct reliable lit search, you know, what is a reliable source, what are good search engines to use, and then um, be able to define the, the types of studies on that features and exemplars slide. Um, there. So if you are on your Canvas page, like I'm in on the lesson page right now, there's this little, um, can you see, are you looking at lesson week five? Is that what your screen says? Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, you've got this Hartnell College Library link. Anybody ever go there? Nah, okay. So Hartnell College Library, because we can't actually walk into the library anymore, right? Like I come from the days of Dewey Decimal, okay, where you walked, anybody remember Dewey Decimal? I'm, I'm aging myself again. Um, Right, and you had the little catalog, and you had to look through the cards, and you had to go find it, you know. And now everything's like computerized, and oh my goodness. So um, if you go to the library, and again, you guys can do this on your own, but it gives you um, research guides, gives you research resources. Um, you can get to whoa, that's like a lot. Um, so it gives you like this CINAHL, CINAHL Plus with full text. That's a really good one if you're doing research for nursing because it'll give you full text articles that you don't have to um, to pay for. So this, but it gives you all these kind of resources for any class you're taking, right? You, these are these are databases for you. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that you knew EBSCOhost is another one. This one here, EBSCOhost, um, that has um, a lot of full text uh, periodicals and journals if you're looking for journal articles. Um, that's another good one to go to, but I wanted just to show you at least what happens when you click on that button, <laughs> that it takes you to the library because we can't actually go to the library um, ourselves anymore, unfortunately. Hopefully someday. All right, so let's go back in. And so for the last like 15 or so minutes, so much information. There we go. Nope, went too far. There we go. Week five. Friday. So um, the other thing I wanted to show you was um, QSIN. If you go into um, 
Houston quality, quality safety initiatives. Um, they also have information, I don't know, it took forever. Oh, there we go. It took forever to load um, last night. So Houston has the, um, you know, collaboration, teamwork and collaboration, um, the patient-centered care, those types of things. It also has evidence-based practice. So being able to integrate the best current evidence with clinical expertise, expertise and patient family preferences. Um, could we talk about that when we talk about patient education? But you have to have specific knowledge, right? Knowledge of the different scientific methods, being able to describe evidence-based practice, um, understanding opinion from evidence, looking at, you know, what is a reliable source? So these are things that we just, that we just were talking about um, and explaining the role in of evidence in determining best clinical practice. So these are the things, the knowledge that we need to have in order to um, perform and, and research and do evidence-based based practice. But we also need to have some skills. So what QSIN does, it, it categorizes it for you in knowledge, skills, and attitudes. So skills, you know, uh, IRB is the Institutional Review Board. If you're actually doing studies, um, there's certain guidelines for the participants in the study that you, you have to make sure they're ethical, um, that you do, you base individualized care plan on patient values and expertise, clinical expertise. Um, you know how to read original research and reports. You know how to find that research. Um, you know how to, or you can participate, right, in the work environment. Things change, right, in the work environment because you fill out an incident report and say, hey, this system isn't working, um, which is also part of curiosity. That's, that's a part of curiosity. Um, and then to have the attitude that goes along with all that is appreciate, you know, that science, science has strengths and weaknesses. Um, we need, you need to do the research ethically um, and value that evidence-based practice uh, is important. And, um, you know, staying up to date, reading relevant uh, professional journals. That's why nurses have continuing education, right? Once you become nurses, yay, um, you will have continuing education that you 30 units th that you have to do every two years, right? We as content experts actually have to do the 30 units every year. That's the California BRN regulation. Um, so that's, that's how, um, how QSIN puts that together for you. Um, and so now if you, in the last, like, what do we have? 10, 15, I think we go to 9.35. I always forget. Um, but what I'd like you to do is to um, go to the case study. There's a case study on um, perfusion and evidence-based practice. Um, and I'll put you in bigger groups for this. But what I'd like you to do is just kind of go through the, um, the case study, it asks you some questions, um, you know, and you can look things up. Like what, what if, are these, what do you think about these blood pressures? You know, how do I know where those fit? Is it okay? Like wh remember where we got the um, stage one and stage two of hypertension, that graph that we have? Um, Whitney, shake your head because you're one of the only ones I can see. You're, okay, thank you. Um, we, <laughs> right, so where did that come from? How do we know that? Right, we looked up evidence. So what I'm gonna do is put you in your groups, kind of just work through it. I know you're not gonna get to the end of it, that's okay. You can read through it, just pick some of the questions if you want. But look, according to national guidelines, right? We're talking about hypertension. I tied this back to hypertension, see what I did there? Um, how, what is the first line of, of medication that you tend to use for hypertension? Anybody, anybody? A loop diuretic. Not a loop. Lucinopril. It's thiazide. Thiazide, thiazide diuretic. Yep, thiazide diuretic. Um, right, so yeah, so just kind of work through that just to look at, um, look at questions. There's a couple labs, you know, so what do you do? You look up in your drug book or you, you look online and go to hopefully a reliable source that tells you what, hey, knock it off. Thank you. Sorry, got the dogs. Um, I'm dog sitting. Um, you know, so you know those, uh, the parameters that you need to have. And then it does come out, you know, well. Um, but just to think about how you, um, how you would do that. Let's see, so you want to stop sharing. Does that make sense? Yes, that is, I mean, oh, there you go. Man dies from eating too much black licorice. That is a top story. Wow. Yeah, he switched to black licorice like two weeks ago and was eating insane amounts. Then he like dropped dead at a, like 
a Walmart or something. Was he eating red licorice before? Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Not good to know. Um, <laughs> that's kind of scary. Um, all right. Let's see. Anything to There we go. All right, y'all know what you're doing? I know you're not gonna get through it, but at least you can start or split up the, the questions. Okay? Okay, bye-bye. Did you get your invite? There you go, good, okay.
pressure continues to be high, the internist decides to, oh, okay. No, you're good. That's all right. Oh, are that, you in our group? You're, no, we're back to the main. Because uh, I want to. You're in our group. <laughs> cool. Um, I know that wasn't much time, and I apologize for that, but I just wanted you to, to be able to look at, look, here's what we've been talking about, right? It's perfusion for the week, and look how much research right that you go in like where does all this information come from where do you know what the risk factors are right uh, how do you know what the classifications for stage one stage two blood pressure right that's all evidence and, and research studies that people have done um i wanted to just real quick where did it go okay can so you should see do you see number 10 after the teaching session yes yes Yes, okay, practice question. After the teaching session, which statement by MP indicates a need for further instructions? This means for me, what I call it is a Sesame Street question. Which one of these is not like the other? Which one of these doesn't belong? Three. Okay, so which, which yeah. one? Which one indicates a need for further instructions, right? I need to rise up slowly. Well, yeah, you do. I need to leave the salt shaker off the table. Yeah, you do. It's okay to skip a few doses. <laughs> Don't skip. Don't skip. <laughs> um, too many games. Watch too many game shit, right? I will call if I feel very dizzy or short of breath, right? We don't want that, right? So the correct answer is number three. So make sure when you read a question, the, the question there it indicates a need for further instructions. That means one of them is wrong, okay? And then the other thing, which one of the lab values are, would you be concerned of, if any? And I know we haven't gone over lab values. Glucose? Not my first choice, but yes. CO2. Which one? Oh, the CO2? What are we looking at when we're doing, um, when we're talking about diuretics? Is it the creatinine? BUN. Electrolytes, right? Electrolytes so, want to be so, monitored. So what is the oh, BUN? When, what does the BUN tell you? Does your kidney function? function? Yeah, but it, and it also is a, an indicator for hydration. So she's, so she's, I mean, it's, that's a normal BUN, um, but I'm thinking a diuretic. What do I need to monitor if the patient's on a diuretic? That it's not too low. That what's not too low? Her electrolytes, electrolytes and fluid. Which electrolyte? Nozomi! Yay, Claudia! Yay! What do you, if it's a diuretic, are sodiums okay? It's potassium sparing, right? It's supposed to be, well, it's, it's, no, it's a thiazide diuretic. Yeah, so we want to make sure we don't get into hypokalemia, right? Where are where are we right now? Right at the very bottom of that that normal range. Yes. Right. So when you're thinking di diuretics, yes, you have like um, I think it was Emily. Right. You have to think through that. Right. Is it potassium sparing? Is it not? Is it is it a loop? Is it, you know if it's thiazide, um, then it it's potentially using up potassium, and I have pretty low potassium right here. So the glucose isn't bad, you know, the glucose, eh, the BUN, eh, but if, if I were to ask you a question, I don't know, I don't think I did, I did but if I were, maybe for the final exam, right? When we're talking hypertension and diuretics, that's what we're looking at is the potassium. Because it can cause the cardiac problems, exactly. Exactly. Ms. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, Greg, yeah. Yeah, can I ask you a question about um, why 
like a diuretic would be um, given in her case. Like I understand how they work as far as like the loops and the thiazides and like that, but she's only, I mean, she's 65 and only weighs like 110 pounds. Like how much extra fluid does she have in her body is kind of what I'm thinking that, because I know like most, most um, elderly people are kind of um, under, you know, they're not very well hydrated anyway, so. But what comes out with the fluid? What else does a diuretic do? I, I get that it brings out the, like, the sodium and that, you know, that causes, that it's like the fluid volume that changes the blood pressure, but it just seems like how much more could she lose? You know what I mean? How much more could she lose? Maybe I'm thinking about it wrong. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's also has kind of like less side effects when you start to work, you know, with those with those other types of drugs when you're messing with the um, the RAAS, you know, looking at that and using like beta blockers and and those are that's why you start with the diuretic because it's like the least invasive and if you can regulate that way, you may never need anything else other than a diuretic. So if you think of Lasix, like that's like you're thinking of the Michelin, you know, man, and you're trying to get all that fluid off. She's not necessarily necessarily edematous or carrying a lot of extra fluid. It's just a way to regulate, um, you know, to keep the regulation in the sodium and potassium so she doesn't accumulate fluid. It's sort of keeping her where she is. And one thing I'll say too, Greg, from, from experience, the, um, the side effects from like a beta blocker, they suck sometimes, man. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm walking around and I mean, like I walk up a flight of stairs and I feel fatigued, you know, and it's because my, that nervous system that normally kicks in when I'm doing that can't kick in because of the way that that particular medication works. And so for somebody that is 65, that is probably already going to be dealing with fatigue issues, you know, just because they're older, um, you don't want to necessarily inhibit that uh, sympathetic nervous system any more than you have to. And so that's why I'm thinking they would start with the diuretic first is because, hey, let's just try and get rid of some blood volume since blood volume equals blood pressure. Um, let's get rid of some of that blood volume before we start messing around with her nervous system uh, being 65 and potentially having, you know, grandkids or something like that that she needs to, you know, to watch or something like that. That's, I mean, that was my, my feeling on it. Yeah, less side effects. Mm -hmm. For sure. All right. I feel like this was productive. Hopefully you do. Um, go ahead and take our break. Let's come back to 47 at, uh, you want to come back at like 10 after? I mean, we'll still, we'll just push it like 10 minutes just because I need to run to Starbucks. So <laughs> just, just down the street. Um, yes, I'm seeing yeses from people. All right. Bye. See you at 1010. You're welcome, Greg. Of course, pumpkin spice. Gross. All right, bye. Bye. Okay. Oops. No.